Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Cash Bar. How are you, Diane? Good. It is 2 p.m. on a Wednesday, and I have a lukewarm Guinness because one of my refrigerators is broken. Listen to me, one of my refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> Does this girl know how to party or what? <laughs> so it's, I got I it out of my lukewarm beer fridge. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know. I remember hearing that's the way they drink it. And then when I went to Ireland, I was like, no, it's cold. Like, it's not warm. I don't know what, I don't know why someone told me that at some point. They drank warm beer in Europe. And I'm like, no, 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 the beers weren't warm. Warm. Yeah, I didn't find that. I didn't find that to be true, too. That's, yeah. just, a, that's just a lie we've told ourselves to mm -hmm. comfort ourselves, I think. Today... <laughs> It's just you and me in the cash bar. Mm -hmm. it's like no guests, nothing, no buffers in between you and I. It's just you, me, and Jarvis Cocker, one of my <laughs> favorite people on the on the face of the planet. We're doing pulp today. Yeah. And I had to, like, I, I really, really, I love pulp a lot. I, I, and it's, it's for the typical reason why I, I love the bands that I do, because I looked at that guy and went, that's a hell of a lot more like me yeah. than any of these other rock star guys. Right. He's a skinny little spindly fellow with his nerdy glasses and his strange fashion sense. Mm -hmm. his, uh, so I was immediately attracted to him, but I wanted to do like, I, I was kind of getting like music nerdy about it. Like I wanted to pick one of like with their deeper cuts, you know, like a song that I, that I really love and that I really respond to. But the more I thought about it, more I was like, you can't talk about pulp without talking about common people right that's the i mean they're not a one-hit wonder but that that song is so much bigger than anything else that they ever did that's you the, have to do it that's the song yeah that yeah like if you don't know anything about pulp you know this song yeah like absolutely and then the way that i relate to the song or the way that i sort of see myself in the song has changed a whole hell of a lot since i was a kid this song came out in 1995 uh, I probably ran into it in 96 or 97 and uh, I was 16 or 17 years old and the first time through well we'll just we'll do the lyrics and then we'll, we'll get to it I think okay I don't know why I'm, I'm sorry I'm blithering and babbling I may have had too much coffee this morning no it's okay doing... this is this is a lot of lyrics you're gonna need your energy for this one <laughs> <laughs> it really is I think that's, that's another reason why I love pulp is because they are so damn wordy so let's yeah. get right to it I wrote all the lyrics out by hand. I probably don't need to with this song. I think I've had this one memorized for at least 20 years. Oh, but anyway, nice. Yeah. She came from Greece. She had a thirst for knowledge. She studied sculpture at St. Martin's College. And that's where I caught her eye. So he's a little saucy to start off with. He's a little sassy. Yeah. He's confident. He's got yeah. a little bit of swagger. That's where I caught her eye. St. Yeah. Martin's is a, uh, is a fancy London art college. So yeah, rich European people going there to study sculpture would definitely be the thing to do. She told me that her dad was loaded. I said, in that case, I'll have rum and Coca-Cola. She said, fine. And then in 30 seconds time, she said, I wanna live like common people. It's a very artist thing to say. Yes. I wanna live like common people. I wanna do whatever common people do. I wanna sleep with common people. I wanna sleep with common people like you. Ooh. Yeah, I so know. 17-year-old me loved this song. Like, absolutely loved that intro. Like, of course, you want to sleep with common people like me, don't you? <laughs> I, want a, I want a fancy, artsy European woman to fall in love with me. I want to sleep with me just because I'm a normal American dude. <laughs> so let me ask you, common people is not the kind of language we would use in America. If it is going to translate, would we just say poor people? <laughs> 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 like, if it was like yeah. a... A, a snooty River Oaks girl going mm -hmm. to college and meeting like someone who she say she's never met anyone in her whole life that wasn't also from River Oaks. Like maybe yeah. someone like me that went to a really um, uh, slightly dangerous public school. Is, is she talking about me? <laughs> yeah, she is. Okay. She's definitely talking about you. They, I think in America we use different words. Like it's not it's not necessarily common people. It's like working class, lower yes. working class, the blue collar, blue, blue collar. collar. There we go. Uh, Dave Chappelle might refer to as dusty white folks. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Those kinds of things. So she's she's very fancy, and she wants to fall in love with uh, with, with with common people. I want to sleep with common people like you. And this is where he gets kind of funny with it. Well, what else could I do? I said, oh. 
I'll see what I can do. I love and that that's line. Where this, this song like picks up a little bit of pace, right? Yeah. He goes, so I took her to a supermarket. I don't know why, but I had to start it somewhere. So it started there. And it's a very, it's a very narrative song. It's obviously, it's, it's telling the story. Yeah. So it says, uh, mm -hmm. I said, pretend you've got no money. And she just laughed and said, hey, you're so funny. I said, yeah. Well, I can't say anyone else smiling here. Are you sure you want to live like common people? He gets very surly and British in the middle of that one. He's obviously jealous. Like, this is a class warfare song. Right. There's no doubt about it. Like, it, it's obviously, this is a rich woman falling in love with a, uh, with a, with a poor guy because it seems like something fun for her to do. Like, yeah. He's not taking his emotions seriously. He's not really taking her very seriously to start off with, but he's also, he has a, a level of vengeance in it that, uh, yeah, it's kind of very almost up. confrontational. He's like, oh, yeah, you want to slum it with me? Let's go exactly. slum it. Let's do yeah, this. Let's go to the supermarket. Let's go. Yeah. Let's, let's see how you handle this. <laughs> Are you sure you want, to, you want to live like common people? You want to see whatever common people see? You want to sleep with common people? You want to sleep with common people like me? But she didn't understand. She just smiled and held my hand. Now, when I was a kid, uh, I kind of had... This is the sort of the journey that I was on with this song. When I was a, a, a kid, I grew up uh, in in Canada till I was fifteen, and it was it was very rural and very cold and uh, and and very you know farm farm country. Okay. And then uh, my dad worked in oil and gas, and he was transferred from Edmonton, Alberta, down to Houston, Texas. And we went from the frozen plains of Canada to the very ritzy suburbs outside of Houston, Texas. And it was a real shock to the system. Like it was, yeah. it was, I mean, they're very similar looking back on it now, the, the Texas economy and the, and the Albertan economy. But for me as a, as a 15 year old kid, like I really went from living in the woods to living in this fancy suburb with all of these kids around me who I don't think really appreciated how good they had it. You yeah. know, like, like I, 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 my journey gets a whole hell of a lot more selfish as it goes on. But in this moment, it was kind of pure in the sense of just like, I was this kid who was coming from a background that was very different than the kid that I was growing up with. And I really felt like, like they, everybody that I knew had a car, everybody I knew had a fancy house, everybody that I knew had a pool. A pool? And, they, and it just seemed like, yeah. And it was totally normal to them. Like that was just, that was just, that was what life was. Yeah. And it was really shocking to me to meet people who lived a life like that. So I really did feel like Jarvis Cocker in this song in high school and in my early college days. Like I felt like the scrappy poor kid who was all of a sudden amongst these very wealthy people. Right. As I got older and, and into college and, and, and started working, you know, jobs, working in, in restaurants and, uh, and I worked for a summer on, uh, on, a, on a pilot boat. You know, uh, that was when I started to realize it's like, no, I come from the wealthy suburbs now too. Yeah, like it, I had to let go of this this idea that I was some scrappy poor kid. Like that's not. I am from these affluent places, and it took me a long time to to recognize that. Like I clung to this identity as as being you know like a, a working class person for a very long time. Right. Long that, after I should have known better. That's got to be hard to switch um, like gears, especially at that age, where you're kind of almost in that rage age where you still want to rebel against that but you having to accept like no i, I i'm in the good life now <laughs> yeah yeah things are and who wants to do that when you're 17 years old when you're 17 no. you want things to be dramatic you want them to be awful you want to you, know, you want to be you know like you want everything to be a struggle because it, because that's the only thing that you can really relate to like you can't who wants to present themselves and say like i have it pretty good everything's yeah. nice that's not a teen <laughs> that's not a teenage thing to do <laughs> that's not rebellious no, at all yeah you want to come from the wrong side of the track so right. like, like even like i just i just didn't it, took a long, it probably took this song for me to admit that i'm we'll get to the end of it <laughs> but i guess when I, when I started when i first fell in love with this song i fell in love with the narrator with jarvis cocker's idea of falling in love with this fancy rich european woman and then showing her what life is really like and then I realized probably when I was about 30 years old, I was like, no, you're way more like the rich woman. <laughs> 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 way more in touch. <laughs> but she didn't understand. She just smiled and held my hand. Rent a flat above a shop. Cut your hair and get a job. Smoke some fags and play some pool. Pretend you never went to school. 
but still you'll never get it right because when you're laid in bed at night watching roaches climb the walls if you called your daddy could stop it all that's how yeah. i felt mm -hmm. like when my when my friends started going off to to college and their parents were renting them apartments in their college town and they didn't have to go to work all they had to do was take four classes a semester get their 12 hours and they were going to like i was so insanely jealous i was mad at them i wanted to grab them and shake them and force them to listen to common people and go your life <laughs> is not normal yes it took me eight years to get a four-year degree because i was paying for it by myself i had semesters where i had to stop and just work um mm -hmm. i also changed majors um i didn't know what i wanted to be i didn't have a safety line i had to just do it as i went and so i get so jealous when i see like you know friends of mine that they graduated in four years their parents they lived in dorms they went out of state their parents paid for everything they didn't have like mm -hmm. a, they had a credit card they could use where i was just like i cannot relate to this <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who you are. That was yeah. definitely the attitude that I had because I was I was overlooking the the advantages that that I did have. You know, I didn't get to go to an out of state school. And my parents didn't give me a credit card or anything like that. But they did take care of me in ways that I was too spoiled to recognize. Yeah, and you had a safety net. If you did fall, you could call your parents, and maybe they could help you financially. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I could call my dad, and he could <laughs> stop it all. Yeah, <laughs> and he did on a couple of occasions. In right. <laughs> uh where was we do, 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 do. Mm, okay you'll, you'll never, never live yeah. like common people again you'll never live like common people you'll never do what common people do you'll never fail like common people you'll never watch your life slide out of you that song lyric always caught me even when i was a kid like even when i was i was going to school i was struggling to to pay for college i had no idea what way what the way forward was going to be for me like even when I when I entered college, I never, I, it it never occurred to me that I was going to graduate. Like I it 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 just seemed like I was just spinning my wheels. This was yeah. the thing that I had to do for for these few months. Right. Uh, but it ne like I didn't know what I was going to graduate with. It never I did I didn't picture myself in a cap and gown. Like I, it never occurred to me that I would ever be a. You didn't have a plan like. and a goal that you were focused on. You're like I'm just surviving right now. Like yeah. I'm just doing what I have to do right mm -hmm. now this month. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't it, it wasn't because I was like 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 plugged into the sur survival trip. It was just that I hadn't. I, it, it it just it just didn't seem necessary to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I just I just felt like I was on another path anyway. Yeah. All the things that I wanted to do with my life had nothing to do with a with a college degree or any kind of any you know any. I, I wasn't trying to the skills that I was trying to bring to market. I wasn't going to learn in college anyway. Yeah. You know, I I had it in my head that I was going to be I was going to be a writer for God's sake. Okay. You know, I was going to be a journalist. I was going to interpret the world around me, man. It didn't work out so well. So I guess we'll get there, but I'm trying to figure out where stand up comedy intersected. <laughs> when I graduated uh, high school. Uh, my my best friend Craig uh, took us to go see uh, a Dave Attell show in 1997, and okay. Dave Attell then and now is just the best comic, the yes. best club comic around. He just made it look so easy. Like he was yeah. just dropping bombs. He just had these these one liners. He just grabbed the microphone and just started dropping them. I could probably I might be able to remember like his whole show from that night. Just like it was just burned into my brain. And then like an idiot. You know, like I got on, I laughed so damn hard and I just walked out of there and just went, I, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the arrogance that arrogance. Like I'm that good. <laughs> it's crazy arrogant when you think, like you see somebody who's who's that good at something, they make it look so easy. He's it, worked it so you. hard to get that good too. <laughs> exactly. And just, just to naturally just toss it off. It was like the greatest thing in the world. Like to get the big reaction, those huge laughs out of people just with your words was just straight up. And just intoxicating to me like yeah. I, I, that, that was when and i was i was pretty much lost after that i started yeah. going to to open mics immediately afterwards and that's uh yeah college pretty much fell by the wayside not okay. long after that <laughs> yeah not to interrupt the lyrics too much but i thank god i didn't get into comedy until my final semester of college or else i may have not finished like i got yeah. into comedy and then i was like this is my final semester after eight fucking years of college to get a four year degree. <laughs> and I had to make the mental note of like, stop, graduate, 
then go back to comedy. And I did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I don't know what I would have done. Like if I hadn't, if I hadn't gone to that, that comedy club that night, you know, I, I think I just would have found something else to, to waste my time on. Me too. Like I, said, I, I, just, I <laughs> fell into comedy on accident and I'm like, what the fuck would I have done without that night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you get into it? Like how did, uh, let's, Okay, I'll do it real fast, and because there's so many sure. more lyrics to this song, <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. I I love we telling have this all story. afternoon. We do. I love telling this story. I my whole life changed. I am married to Corbin because my best friend and roommate at the time, Anita, got her hair cut on a Wednesday. It all it's like the butterfly effect. It swivels on her hair appointment on that Wednesday. We live together. She had a hair appointment. She came home. Her hair looked good. And she's like, I look too good to not to just sit in this house. Let's go somewhere. <laughs> like she, she's, she's feeling herself. So I was like, okay. Um, we had previously, we were living in Montrose and we had previously ridden our bikes by, um, the, at the time it was called Helios, but it used to be the mausoleum. It's now Avant Garden. And mm -hmm. I, we remember being like, that place looks cool. What is that? So I was like, hey, let's go to that place that we saw. We get there, the guy's taking cover at the front door and it was Quint Hatch. And uh, I was like, what are we paying cover for? And he's like, well, up downstairs is um, poetry, upstairs is stand-up comedy. And I was like, oh, well, we'll do comedy. And we went up there and it was an open mic and Eric Diekman was running it. And <laughs> I was always had like just some dirty jokes in my mind, like my own jokes some thoughts mm -hmm. and, um, I was telling my friend Anita, I was like, I always kind of thought I could do this. And she was like, sign up. I was like, oh, hell no. And then I saw a couple of comics go up and one was like, I shouldn't say this out loud. It was Alba Mani. Anyway, and they were, yeah. <laughs> there was a couple of comics that went up and I was like, I can do that. And so I went back yeah. to Eric Dietman and I was like, hey, I want to do this. I want to go up. I was like, can you put me at the end of the line? And he goes, no, I'll. I'll put you in the middle. And so I just furiously grabbed a couple of napkins and wrote down a couple of the thoughts. And um, it's kind of like, what the fuck am I doing? But not really taking it that serious. I'll probably never do this again. And long story short, I got up there and did well. I, I did really yeah. well. And they all like hoarded on me afterwards. It was like, you have to go to the last stop Monday night, open mic, you get five minutes, don't go over your time. Like all, and this was like a Wednesday and that following Monday, I did my first open mic at the last stop and did well. And wow. it was on like Donkey Kong after that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have like the, the reverse of it. Like, like I saw somebody who's like literally the best in the world at it. And you saw some people who are, you know, open <laughs> micers. So the worst in the world at it. <laughs> we both had to say, I can do that. I can, I can do that. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. This mind is tinged with massive arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> And my jokes were just filthy. I had such a like almost shock value filthy mind. And I think just coming out of like this 27 year old cute girl mouth was the, the kicker and it worked well at the first open mic. But then I had that journey of learning like, no, you need to write better than that. And I immediately yeah. understood it and started writing better than that. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I still beat myself up about is like, I, I would like to go back and try it again and do it without shock and without yes. momentum and without volume like like just do it like in the language of stand-up comedy just like yes. can you make them laugh for five minutes consistently just yeah. set up punchline set up punchline. i don't think I set ever up got to a point where i was doing that the right way right but i'm always i've always been mad at myself for it <laughs> i still always think i'm gonna do it i still always think mm -hmm. i'm gonna go back and do it right i'm like i'm 43 <laughs> like, <laughs> i don't know maybe um, we won't shut it down yet let's keep going with these lyrics where do we leave? Oh, we, we, we ever watch your life slide out of view? That's why I was, I, I, that was always a really attractive lyric to me, you know, in a weird, like negative aspirational way, where I wanted to watch my life slide out of view. That was you know, something like appealing a, about that? Yeah, it kind of like, I don't know, it certainly wasn't the beginning of my self destructive tendencies, but it described it in a way that that I wasn't used to at the time like, like yeah that's what I want to do like I want I want these opportunities that I'm only dimly aware of to sort of go away so that all that I'm left with is is whatever I am yeah you know and that I mean? you're connecting to the Greek girl now yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah 
for sure. Uh, you dance and drink and screw because there's nothing else to do. I always thought that was a funny line too. Because it that's, is true. Like that's I heard, the best I part about being is. common people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forget whose joke it was, but somebody told me once just like, yeah, sex is just fun for poor people. <laughs> 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 and and dumb people, like. especially when you're just being careless about it, like, ah, who needs a condom? I don't know your name. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. It takes all the fun out of it when you have to be like, time out, do you have protection? Like, I don't know. It's just fun to be like dumb and reckless. Yeah. They're like, oh, just, it's crazy to think about that. <laughs> but mm. Why are they? Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> like, yeah. Sing along with the common people sing along and it might just get you through laugh along with the common people laugh along even though they're laughing at you uh, that was the that was the one where the worm really started to turn for me like i i always felt like i was the one laughing at these at these rich kids who didn't understand how good they had it until i started working in restaurants working in bars and actually living my life and i was laughed at a number of times <laughs> for yeah. the things that the things that i didn't understand they, like like it's insane to me. Like the first time you start, the first time you start paying rent, the first time the bills actually start piling up, like the real ones. Yeah. The, there was a time for me when I was, I was still, you know, living at home with my, with my mom and dad, but I was, I was working and, and paying for college, but I could, like, I could cut those corners. You know, if like, if there was a textbook that I did this once for a, a history class, like the, the, the history textbooks were too expensive. So I just thought to myself, well, history is history. Like, just go to the bookstore. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. Buy any history book on the subject and read that. And it worked fine for me. And I think yeah. it actually worked out well because instead of actually like parroting the facts that were in the textbook, I had this whole new set of facts. So I think the professor was just like, well, this guy's very well read. He understands the material completely. So there's an A. That's a good, that's a good avenue. It was not a bad cheat code. I wouldn't yeah. recommend it in every in every subject. Those oh, textbooks were or wildly math. expensive. They were crazy. They I had, were crazy expensive. I used to go to half price books and sell just common books that I had to help make a little bit of scratch to help pay for. I was so big at selling everything I owned to make to make money to get textbooks. Like I would be like, <laughs> I don't I don't need this table in my house anymore. Who wants to buy this table? I mean, I was just. They're so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I used to shoplift from Barnes and Noble and then take Whoa. the proceeds down to half price books and sell them for cigarette money. Oh, yeah. 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 That's I mean, survival you're not, mode. You're not going to get rich robbing from Barnes and Noble and selling to half price books, but you can get a pack of cigarettes in 1997. Yep. They were like $2. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like great. they wanted us all to have lung cancer. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that was like the first time there was a moment in my life where I could cut corners. Like if even if the bills were second up, like if I couldn't afford the, the the textbook, I could I could shortcut it or not buy it altogether. And there was no real like life consequence. You know, it yeah. wasn't until a couple of years later, just like I didn't pay the electric bill. So now I'm sitting here in the dark with a candle. You yeah. know, or I didn't make any money this week and now I'm hungry and I've got a bag of rice. You know, like yeah. that, that came later for me. Yeah, you discover ramen in in a non yeah. non fun way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's the only thing where I'm eating, uh, and the stupid things that you do because you think that poor is cool, and I sure did think that poor was cool. Yeah, like I really lost my my desire to 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 keep pace with the kids that I went to high school with. Really faded when I started working in, in restaurants, because I saw these people that were, that were my age, they had, they're getting paid cash every night. Their share of the rent was something like $400, hundred dollars for, for car insurance. Nobody had a cell phone back then. No. So that's it. Like basically your nut was $500. You could make that over the weekend and everything else was just party time. Yeah, like I told, It was just party time. Like yeah. I just fell in love with that. I fell in love with that server bartender lifestyle where it's just like it's good like it doesn't matter that you're broke today because yeah. you're going back to work tomorrow and you'll be making money again yeah and like you had your friends who had drinks and cigarettes and you would just bum off each other and have fun and drink there was always ways to get what you needed as far as vices go and um they were fun times like as broke as i was i was like oh some fun i had some fun during those times yeah it's crazy how vice only finds you when you're poor like that. <laughs> like, like, why do we, like, I, I, I don't, I don't really have an answer for it, but like, why do we seek out 
cigarettes and boo- I guess obviously it's just to soothe ourselves, right? Yeah, it's self-soothing for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's communal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Like everybody's suffering through the same thing together. Yeah. You find, yeah, that's the thing. Like, like what's your favorite bar? Like it's not necessarily the bar with the, the music that you like or the, or the it, it's, it's the bar with the people in it that you most relate to yep. socioeconomically. You know, there's yep. no way I'm going to do a rich person, not just because I can't afford it, but also because like, what are we going to talk about? I can't talk to you about property tax. I have no idea what it's like. No, like after every Monday night, open night, open mic, we all went to Cecil's pub and mm-hmm. I would have never been caught dead in one of those bars where girls wore short tight dresses and the drinks were expensive. I, that's my hell. I didn't own a dress like that, nor would I wear one. I'm like, I want to go with the people who have tattoos for eyebrows. Like I want to go hang out with those people. And I, <laughs> and I did. Those were mm-hmm. where I felt comfortable. You want to go see your people. Yeah. You want to live with common people. Anyway. This is where the, uh, where the where the song really takes the uh, takes a, a dark dark dive. This is when he, like a dog lying in the corner, they will bite you and never warn you. Look out, they'll tear your insides out. So this is obviously him talking to his his European rich lover. Here's where it gets real. Yeah, yeah. The, these poor people don't like you very much. They don't <laughs> want going you to turn on you pretending to have fun in our space like it's a little pet project get the fuck out of here with that because everybody hates a tourist especially one who thinks it's all such a laugh yeah and the chip stains grease will come out in the bath what is that so the chip stains is like like french fries okay so you're you know you're eating like takeaway food you know fish and chips or something like that you smell like grease you're horrible but it's fun because you're eating poor people street food and And she can just wash it off she can just wash that right out of her hair she'll be fine nothing to worry about and this is true like this is what kind of what we talk about on this podcast all the damn time is the idea that like the worst thing you can be when you're a teenager is a is a poser a (laughs) poser or a joiner or like you're fraudulent somehow like you have to have the you have to have the the bona fides bona fides i don't know how to pronounce it bona fides Bonafides. You mm-hmm. got to be able to show your metal, right? And if you can't do that, yeah, people will like no matter what group you're in. If you don't have those bona fides, they will smell it on you right away. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's a Mark Maron line that he quotes from William S. Burroughs all the time. Uh, it's the uh, "No one can hide the mark inside them." Yeah. Which is yeah. absolutely true. Like, like one of the things that 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 I found as I started, you know, you know, bartending and things like that is that like there are, I don't think that anybody who is a con artist or a con man thinks of themselves that way. Like, I don't think they wake up in the morning and go, it's time to go defraud some people. Yeah. It just comes like, you just, you slowly see where your options are. And it, like, it just gets into your, into your soul. You learn to spot the weaknesses in people and then you learn to exploit them. Out of necessity. Yeah. yeah. It's a survival there, skill. Yeah, there were plenty of times when when I was a young man, people would compliment me for being smart and and well read or, or, or articulate or something like that. And I just like would, would just straighten up my back and it would strengthen my jaw and I'd feel really good about it. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized they were just buttering you up, man. They could just <laughs> see that that was how your ego works. Like that's how you can they inflate you until you pop. Maybe, maybe a little column A, column B, but like you are well-read, you are smart. (laughs) Like you have like literary knowledge that like I also studied, but I didn't retain. (laughs) Somehow you were able to retain this stuff. I don't either. Some of it, it's all gone. It's all gone. (laughs) (laughs) The chip stains grease has come out of the bath for me. And it really gets into the rent. You will never understand how it feels to live your life with no meaning or control and with nowhere left to go. You're amazed that they exist and they burn so bright whilst you can only wonder why, which is definitely a thing that I've been on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> like I have definitely watched uh, people who have struggled a whole hell of a lot more than I have go off and achieve things that I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. And they've only been able to do it because they've been through a crucible and a, and a fire that I just haven't had to walk through myself. And some people just get lucky too. There's a lot mm-hmm. of luck involved and, you know, this whole idea of um, 
this is where my brain goes with it. The people who, the haves versus the have nots, the people who are the haves, a lot of them have a story of like, well, my father was poor and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and whatever. And I was like, okay, that doesn't fucking work for everybody. Some people don't have boots. They live in a boot desert, (laughs) you know? Your dad Mm -hmm. may have fallen into good choices. Some people don't have those choices and they were never there. And uh, I don't know, I can go off on a tangent about that. That gets, ends up being political, but. um, It's not political, it's it's eternal. Cause this is the, this is like the, the, the Viking poetry. Like it's been going on for thousands of years. It's like the old saying that hard times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men weak men create hard times <laughs> i so like that five cir- generation cycle circle of life <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yep <laughs> and it's pretty disturbing or at least it can be if you look at if you look at that list that that five cycle honestly like for me i was looking at it's just like oh oh whoa oh <laughs> where am i uh-oh. falling on here <laughs> yeah i think i'm uh-oh. I think I'm a weak man creating hard times oh <laughs> shit <laughs> i gotta turn this around somehow <laughs> recognizing it is powerful though because then that's where you come to a crosswords crossroads and you can make a choice um mm-hmm. at least try at least try mm-hmm. to you know if a choice is available <laughs> <laughs> then he goes back into the into the course again rent a flat above a shop cut your hair i always wanted to have a, a flat above a shop yeah that there's sounds a, great right yeah there was a bar in kima that had a uh, had an apartment up above it that i was like constantly scanning it like oh i hope that comes up for rent i yeah. want to live above the bar in kima yes it that's really cool disaster but i really really wanted to there was there's been a couple of places like that in my life or like that. that's my dream apartment that's where i want to waste myself yeah the closest we can get to in houston seeing how we don't have zoning laws is i lived very close to a bar that i could walk to <laughs> and a good restaurant <laughs> and i'm like well it was close <laughs> <laughs> i'm ashamed to say that when i one of the places that i lived in in clear lake i chose the apartment complex because it was in, within walking distance of three bars nice it's that yeah. was my only thinking on it. I didn't care about the floor layout. I didn't care how it was colored. I didn't even really care about the price. I was just like, that's fine. That's where I want to be. Saves your own life from drinking and driving. It's it's very practical to me, Ben. (laughs) Could very well have. I'm a problem solving ape. There you go. (laughs) Uh, But you'll never get it right because when you're late in bed at night watching roaches climb the walls and you called your daddy could stop it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That's Jarvis Cocker. He's a very, very funny man. He had the, uh, this is a, I, I don't know if you read this, but this is a story that you'll love about him. He once judged a karaoke contest of his own songs. Like he had <laughs> literally a bar room full of people go up and just sing pulp songs. And oh, he was the sole fun. judge of it. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> Which song won, do you know? Uh, I was a kid who did a song called The Fear. And okay. it was like, it was literally a nine-year-old boy who went up and started doing the lyrics to The Fear. And The Fear is like a, it's a, all pulp songs are kind of perverse in a way, but that one is particularly gross. It's uh, <laughs> the chorus is, here comes the fear again, the end is near again. Uh, if you ever find that thing that you lack, if you ever get that monkey off your back, you can't get anyone to come in the sack and here it comes another panic attack. <laughs> oh, <here we> go. <laughs> a nine-year-old saying this? And a nine-year-old saying that, yeah. <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> That's <Exactly>. great. Exactly. <laughs> Did it, so I, I remember the song Common People, but I don't know Pulp the way you do. So hearing it kind of fresh again after a lot of years, I'm like, this is, he sounds blazingly like Bowie. Do you pick up on that? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, he definitely had the uh, had the. He had, he had some of Bowie's androgyny, but but all of his lyrics were were just in the sense that he was like like thin and fashionable and everything like that. But in his lyrics, it's always been been very very heterosexual and and very sort of. Uh, I don't know how to like. He just had like a bitter sexuality to him. Mm-hmm. He's got a song. One of his bigger songs is called "Do You Remember the First Time." And it's almost like a David Tell joke. The whole song is about it's, it's, he's singing a song to the to the woman that he lost his virginity to many years ago, and it's that old joke like, uh, 
You ever want to go back and have sex with the first person you had sex with just so you could show them how good you got at it? <laughs> hey, look who's not crying. It's like, it's like that okay. joke in song form. Do you remember oh, okay. the first time? I can't remember a worse time. But you know that we've changed so much since then. Oh, yeah, we've grown. No, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you screw him just as long as you save a piece for me. Oh, so wow. he was, yeah, like he, this is not a guy who was uh, big on love. <laughs> well even just the the breathy delivery and the cadence of how he sings reminded me of bowie and the sound of his voice like when i listen to common people for the first time in a long time i just feel like i've been so connected to bowie over the years especially since his death i've been tuned in and i was like this sounds very bowie <laughs> like i could see yeah. bowie covering this and sounding exactly like it yeah like, and it would be fascinating to see, to hear a, a Bowie cover of that song because it would, it would change the dynamic quite a bit because there's nothing common about Bowie. No. Like, Bowie is very, very posh. It would be really fun to, to hear his take on that. Yeah. Like, like Mick Jagger kind of likes to pretend that he's all down and dirty despite the, the London School of Economics. But you kind of buy this song coming from Jagger. I wouldn't buy yeah. it coming from Bowie. No. You'd have to change it up somehow. No, he'd like, have to be in character. But... This wouldn't be like a, yeah. He would be in the character of a guy doing this but yeah this is not bowie's life yeah like ripped jeans bowie i have to say i wrote down listening to the song it reminded me <laughs> back in like the mid-2000s when sarah talamash still lived in houston and we were doing comedy and she was dating a different guy that um her and her boyfriend at the time used to laugh at the idea of like what if we had on the weekend like a suburban like date night where we just went to Chili's and then we went to see a movie and then we went home and went to bed <laughs> and we laughed so hard at the idea of doing that because it was so far removed of from our life back then I'm like so you're not gonna drink at all I mean <laughs> our Monday nights back then were so crazy like you know Laugh stop open mic, followed by Cecil's till 2 a.m. Drinks, cigarettes, the whole thing. And then by the time the weekend came, that's when the wheels fell off. I mean, it just got <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, and so the idea of dumbing ourselves down to have what like the suburban common people night. Um, yeah. But I will say now that you know I'm married and 43 and a mom that lives in a very Christian suburban town, I still laugh at the idea of like, hey Corbin, let's have a, <laughs> let's have a date night where we go to Chili's and see a movie. <laughs> like, it would just be so weird. I've never done that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I find fascinating about about this song and how I. Like we, we talked about it on the last episode, I think a, a couple of times, but like how your perception changes. Like I always think of it in the, the reality bites thing. It was like when I was a kid, Troy Dyer was the hero of that movie. Now when I watch it, I realize that Ben Stiller is kind of the hero of that movie. We talked about that many, many times. Yes. This song was a total reversal for, for and kind of like 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 for, for you and me, where like I, I grew up or I finished high school in the town that, that you live in now. Yeah. And then since then, like, I haven't been able to achieve those sorts of things. I haven't been able to, to, to graduate college or buy that house, or I haven't been able to maintain living in the same social sphere that my parents were able to lift themselves into. Right. So like, like I, I come from that background, but now at three o'clock in the morning, you're going to catch me like mopping up a barroom floor. <laughs> you know, like, it's because you didn't marry the Corbin. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> That's not why. Like, no, because like you, like you say, you went through eight years of school. You finished it. You got your degree. You know, if you were, if you weren't married, you'd be a successful graphic designer right now. I would hope so. I would hope to think that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have a house in Friendswood just on my own accord. But um, so I'll say just a brief history of my timeline. Uh, I went through it today and I have lived in 24 different residences my whole life. Um, and they range from like, you know, my parents <clears throat> were, got pregnant as teenagers. So we had a teenage pregnancy situation and they didn't want to live at home. So they moved out. So it started off with like a very tiny, tiny almost the size of a camper trailer uh, on the north side of Houston. And like, we lived in three different trailers and the majority of like my childhood from like, you know, very young to like 10 years old was in a trailer. And then my parents split up and my mom and I moved out and went to like an apartment on the outskirts of Greenspoint. Um, for people who live in Houston, they know it's not like the greatest part of town, but that's what Guns we could- Guns Point. Guns Point. 
and that's what we could afford. Um, but then my parents got back together and they bought a house, our first house. Um, and it was like a very middle, lower middle class suburb. So we got a house in the suburbs, but it was on the poor end. And that's where I lived from like 10 years old to 17 when my parents divorced. Between, when my parents divorced in 1996, from 1996 to 2006, I was so fucking transient. I lived in 14 different places in those 10 years. <laughs> it was all over the place. Like my mom and I, you know, she divorced my dad and her and I moved into an apartment. And that first apartment we lived in, it was robbed while I was there. It got kicked doored while I was in the apartment. And I had to oh escape God. while the guy got in the house. Like it was nuts. Um, and then, like, I lived with a couple different boyfriends. Wait, Becca, you got to tell that story. Like, so you're just you're just sitting watching TV, eating a bowl of Cheerios. And I then... was. It was spring break, my senior year of high school. I'm in this apartment, and uh, I'm asleep. My mom went to work. I'm alone in the house, um, and somebody was knocking really hard on the door. We're on the downstairs, and uh, I was just gonna ignore it. Like, uh, they'll go away. And then he knocked really hard again. And I was just kind of like, what the fuck? And so I'm in a nightgown and I get up and I, we have a peephole and I look out the peephole and there's like, you know, this really big guy in a starter jacket with the hood up. So I couldn't really see his face. And um, I was like, uh, I don't know what's going on here. So I go back into my room and I put on pants because I, I don't know, I just have this feeling like I may need pants for this. <laughs> so I put on a pair of pants with my nightgown still over it. And he moved on to my next door neighbor and was knocking on their door. And I was like, maybe he's a solicitor selling magazines. I don't know. He comes back and I'm just watching him through the peephole and I slow, there was a big deadbolt and I slowly deadbolted the door. It, like so quietly that he couldn't hear me. I was too dumb to be like, yeah. yellow, ruff, 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 ruff. like so I'm here, <laughs> like, hello. Um, I was I just wasn't smart enough. And so I was just like, I slowly deadbolted the door. And he I saw him turn around and motion to a car in the parking lot to like back up. And then and I was like, I'm about to get robbed. And um I turned around to run to the luckily there was a back door patio and we were on the first floor that I knew I could just jump over the fence and go I was like two feet turning around to run when he fucking started kicking and if I hadn't dead bolted that door it, the door would have gone down the first kick um, oh so that God. stopped the door from coming down and just like every white girl in every scary movie I fell <laughs> I fell <laughs> in the middle of my living room but that fell probably was like a millisecond because like I fell and was like on my feet again and flung open the back door as I could hear him in the apartment. Like he saw me. Um, and I shit. think I did like a one hand Olympic leap over the little like um, patio fence and then just uh. like hauled ass running to the front office. And uh, long story short, the neighbor upstairs was home and he heard the whole thing and he came out with a gun um, pointing I mean, it at the guy and the guy left. Uh, yeah. he, when we got back to the apartment, like my TV had been ripped out onto the couch. And I think that's as far as he got. And then he heard the guy upstairs, like, what the fuck? you know, um, right. but I was, I was fine. I got out. But yeah. after that, my mom was like, let's move out and move into my boyfriend's house. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then that just started, like, we lived with her boyfriend for a while. And I didn't want to live there. I went and lived with my boyfriend. And then we jumped around to like seven different apartments. And then you know, I eventually started going to college at U of H and I got um, a place with my friends in Montrose and then lived in just like a few places. Another story, <laughs> before I moved in with Corbin, I met, I moved in with Corbin in 2006. One of the apartments I lived in, uh, I was single and living on my own, but I think my downstairs neighbors either smoked crack or meth. I don't know which one, but it smelled so bad in my apartment because it would just rise up through the vents. And I was like, are they burning plastic down there? <laughs> they never sleep. <laughs> it's weird. And then one night in the middle of the night, it was, I had the window open and I think I heard someone get beaten to death. I heard a woman screaming and I heard like blunt force until the screaming slowly stopped. And I was like, I think I just heard a murder. <laughs> And oh my God. I moved out of that place and lived on Hazard Street for a while. And then 
my life turned when I started dating Corbin. I moved into his three-story condo mansion in Montrose. (laughs) And then everything went uphill after that. You know, we got married. We bought our first house in the Heights, had a baby. The Heights is great, but, you know, no yard. And then that's when he moved us out to Friendswood. And and I've been living the good life, Ben. (laughs) And there ain't ain't no turning back. (laughs) You earned it. (laughs) I hope so. What happened with the murder? Did you call the police? Did you? No. No, I did call the front office and was like, hey, I think my neighbors are smoking crack and I heard someone get murdered. I don't care what you do to me. I'm moving out today. As far as like breaking (laughs) a lease, I never heard from them. There was never anything on my record. They must have been like, yeah, go. You should have been here in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) I hate the way that my brain works when you're telling the story about the smell of like, like, like meth or crack. And I realized like, I don't know what meth or crack smells like. I should probably find that out. I think I I know because one time in high school, I found myself at a party and um, it was, I was like a brief moment hanging out with like some people I probably shouldn't have. And I walked by one room in this party and I could see them smoking out of like a glass bong. And it was, I was like, that's not weed. Like it smelled like plastic. It smelled, and I think someone told me that's crack or yeah. maybe it was either crack or meth and I just I always remembered kind of that smell and um that's what I smelled from my neighbors and I just remember being like dude I'm inhaling this I can't be here <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the great Sean Rouse joke about crystal meth where he says if you're going to do crystal meth you got to have a really it's addictive you have to have a really strong will strong willpower like me I did crystal meth one time for about 18 months <laughs> god i love sean rouse <laughs> me too <laughs> so yeah that's the like... difference in our trajectories <laughs> from there you common go. people you brought out my common people i love the the, the like like just just how, how like some of the, the Jarvis Cocker quotes are, are absolutely I think they, they kind of apply to us I sort of wanted to open the episode with this he apparently had a concert where he said uh, we'd like to apologize for our secondhand and slightly shabby form of glamour so <laughs> I'm gonna steal that line from now on how you doing I'm doing well I'd like to apologize for my secondhand and slightly shabby form of glamour <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, Corbin could relate to that you know because Corbin does really well you know he's taken over his dad's business but um he refuses to look like it like Corbin will not wear a shirt that doesn't have a hole in it or um he doesn't always wear deodorant and he has a mohawk and uh much to his business partners um I don't know the word at the time chagrin I don't know chagrin yeah uh he's like, please put on a colored shirt for this meeting. And he's like, Ugh. like he, won't. <laughs> he wants to always be seen as common people, <laughs> which I find um, I like, I prefer. Don't make me fancy. Yeah. I don't like fancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Comfortable. I'd rather be comfortable than fancy. Yeah. I think that's the way I would like to do it too. Well, I think that's common people, or at least that's uh, that, that, that's my end of common people. I love it. I think this is a great spot before we forget to insert Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson with Jeremy Essig. Let's see how he tied Jarvis Cocker and Pulp to uh, uh, Tommy Stinson. Let's hear it now. Hey, Barflies. Welcome to another Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson. This week, we're going to connect to the band Pulp through a cover of their hit Common People, as done by Starfleet Captain William Shatner. In 2004, Shatner released his second album of music, Has Been, which was largely co-written and produced by Ben Folds. Leading off the album of Folds' Shatner collaborations, however, was a cover of Pulp's Common People, done as a duet between Shatner and Joe Jackson. That's the, is she really going out with him, Joe Jackson, not Michael's abusive father. The album also includes the song, I Can't Get Behind That, a collaboration between Folds, Shatner, Henry Rollins, and King Crimson guitarist Adrian Blue, who before joining King Crimson in the 80s, spent part of the previous decade as a sideman for David Bowie. Drummer Sterling Campbell would serve a similar role with Bowie two decades later, while at the same time being a member of Soul Asylum, a band that would eventually include Tommy Stinson in the mid-2000s. So looking at the Shatner album alone, we could have made connections using Ben Folds, Henry Rollins, 
Joe Jackson, or even Amy Mann, who also appears. So why choose Adrian Ballou? Well, Ballou also collaborated with Trent Reznor on the Nine Inch Nails album, The Downward Spiral, much as their debut album, Pretty Hate Machine, would feature guitar work from future Filter frontman Richard Patrick, who grew up in Cleveland with his brother Robert Patrick, the actor best known as T2, as discussed last week by Doug Mellard, Ben, and Diane. So, this week we went Pulp to William Shatner, to Adrian Ballou, to David Bowie, to Sterling Campbell, to Soul Asylum, to Tommy Stinson. And to answer last week's riddle, you can go Robert Patrick to his brother Richard and his band Filter to Nine Inch Nails, which connects us back to Adrian Blue. Back to Diane and Ben. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> nice work, Jeremy. As usual. I know I don't know what he said. I'm saying nice work without hearing it. I just know when I told him we we're doing pulp, he's like, Oh yes, I get to talk about William Shatner. So <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot about the William Shatner cover of this song. <laughs> yes. Um, our Dressed Up Like a Douche uh, this week comes from my friend Mary Beth Duggins. There's this, apparently, I don't listen to this, but there's a song called Cyclone by T-Pain. I sounded very Texan when I said that. Cyclone? Um, <laughs> Cyclone by T-Pain. And the lyric is, she moves her body like a cyclone. And her cousin always saying, she moves her body like a psych ward. <laughs> oh they're always so much better <laughs> <laughs> and i was like depending on the song i may have been guilty of dancing like that <laughs> from time to time yeah. <laughs> so body like a psych ward it's crazier when she or it's hotter when she's crazy how do you move like a psych ward <laughs> i'm trying to figure it out <laughs> well i think you gotta like, like your arms mm, have to be in the straight jacket a little there you go hannibal right lectory protective like the psych ward hmm. <laughs> all right ben i don't know if you're ready for this but next week is a patreon mm -hmm. votes week and we are going to welcome comedian mark ag to the podcast to help us discuss a genre of music we have not touched on we have done 54 episodes and although we did some r&b we have not done any hip-hop so because I don't know hip hop. I know. <laughs> we'll get into it next week. But like the reason I don't, because I don't know, like, how am I supposed to appreciate it? Is it okay for me to appreciate I know. it? By the way, what, I, how am I supposed to relate to it? It's not written for me. It's. That's I what I know. told Mark. I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. I love watching white Canadian Ben squirm as he has to mansplain black lyrics. It's always my yeah. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark's white too. But um, I don't think you have to worry about next week. Uh, we're getting into some 90s hip hop and we're doing a deep dive into the lyrics of one of these three songs by Tupac. We're going Tupac, um, which I think is fun. I mean, you don't have to know Tupac's music. There's so much in the history of Tupac that everybody knows and you know mm -hmm. the how he died. And Mark, Ben, don't worry, is an aficionado at this. Uh, he said he has seen every documentary about Tupac. Like, we're just going to follow his lead next week, which is great. But before we do that, we have to tell them the Patreon members are voting on these three songs. Hit them up, changes to live and die in LA. So we'll see which song they choose. Yes, I know two of those three songs. Good, I don't. That's right. I know <laughs> no, I know, hit him up. know about hip hop. My street cred is solid. Well, what Mark said is these are three very different songs. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see like, and honestly, the majority of our Patreon listeners are your family, my father-in-law. My father-in-law was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but we'll see. I think I, I'm up for any of it. And I'm really just going to let Mark lead us down this path. So I'm excited. There you go. Mom, what's your favorite Tupac song? <laughs> That's yeah, really funny. <laughs> All right, Ben, this was Pulp. I had a great time. Bogue. Oh.